Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Af Mohotra on Straight Talk. Now, it's been a while since I've been on the show, and so forgive me. I've been dealing with all sorts of interesting things in my life over the course of the last few weeks. And there was one show that I really wanted to do and had to keep skipping. And finally, I've managed to secure my guest today. I'm, pr I'm privileged to have this particular guest because she is a pioneer in the diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging space, a space that is close to my heart. Uh, she's written numerous books, uh, four at least, that have been published, and I'm sure there are many she's written unofficially that never got published, or she has in here, in her mind. And she has been an activist, a champion, a cheerleader, a pioneer in helping the world and all of us to understand uh, this difference between dominant and non-dominant people or thinkers and doers. She has interviewed leading uh, leaders, world leaders, uh, presidents and prime ministers, who are women presidents and prime ministers in the world, at least 14, if not more, and worked with them, understood why they do what they do, how they examine and think about leadership. And she's been doing that for a long while, you know, uh, way before the, 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 the recent diversity, equity, inclusion trend that you know and you will believe has has made a big difference to us in society and and business as well and so i'm honored to have laura liswood on the show today laura thank you for giving me your time and uh your presence and your energy and i'm excited about the conversation for the next 60 minutes or so so welcome yeah thank you so much and i i too have been waiting eagerly to have this conversation with you, because I know you're quite thoughtful in, in this arena and several other arenas where you probed deeply into them. And uh, so I think this conversation is just going to be uh, one that will be interesting for both of us and hopefully also for your listeners. Yeah, absolutely. I have no doubt. And I'm going to go right into it. And one of the first things we we do, and I love to do on Straight Talk, is before we get into the core subject, is to really try and spend a little bit of time on the person. Uh, because you know, I find that you're you're a product of your past. You're a product of your 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 existing uh, actions and and doings, and some of the the history where you came from, why you did what you did, um, what changes you made in your life, how you connected the dots back and forth. It does matter because then people start to understand the psychology of your writing, your narrative, why. Um, why you write the way you do and why you're on this mission and you continue to sustain that mission. So if you wouldn't mind, and I certainly would, I'm inquisitive and curious myself, tell us a little bit about your your personal story. Of course, your work story, we will touch on, but you know, where, where were you born? Where do you come from? How do you sort of end up in this place? And and you have time, so you can you can be free. Well, I don't, we don't need to go into much of my personal background, but uh you know, look, I was born in 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 California, uh, yeah. and uh, had a, you know a sort of a one of these childhoods that was both interesting and challenging. Um, my father, uh, and this is relevant for future for me in my own uh, journey. My father was a uh, was known as a California Highway Patrolman, so he was a police officer, and uh, which meant we actually traveled quite a bit. We we moved quite a bit around the state, uh, but you know I. I I think that I've always had sort of a uh, particularly a question or an issue or a sense about make ensuring that women and and this this was I was on an, an evolutionary thought process because I think I was focused mainly on women um, initially uh, when I went to undergraduate school and then I decided to go on to law school and then on to business school but in all of that it was how to make sure that at least in, at the at the, at the in the initial part of my thinking was how yeah. to make sure that women got heard got seen got considered as much as men did yeah now i got a little more sophisticated when i began to think about okay there are other people who aren't getting seen and aren't getting heard and aren't getting taken into account also and that's where you, when you reference the dominant non dominant is how i started to think about this but you know i I really wanted to. Uh, I did not grow up with 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 very much money, and so for sure I wanted to make sure that I could uh, could uh, you know feed myself and my family if, if necessary. So that's why I think I continued on from undergraduate to law school to business school. Although I sometimes joke that uh, I, when I went to law school, 
I learned how to read half the Wall Street Journal. And then when I went to business school, I learned how to read the second half of the, the, the <laughs> Wall Street Journal. Uh, but, you know, and it was interesting because I went to public schools initially through law school and then decided that I would, when I decided I wanted to go on to business school, um, I decided I'd apply to one business school. If I didn't get into that, I would just continue down the path of being a lawyer. But so I applied to one and uh, and I also wanted to get out of California. So and this turned out to be a, a business school in Boston, as they often say, a well-known Eastern business school. Uh, so yep. and there I really sharpened my thought process around um, people who I found seemingly had the divine right to rule you know, and uh, other people who were say, struggling to to get into the possibility of being able to, you know, uh, have an impact on, on the world. Uh, because uh, at least at the Harvard Business School, there were certainly some people who just felt like, well, this was their destiny to, to rule, you know, mm -hmm. to be at the top, you know, and they were entitled to that. And, you know, that that's kept that's that's kept me on the path. You know, that's kept me on the path. And, you know, I, I went on to do some work in in, in business and uh, then, you know, had the, you referenced me, my meeting these women leaders. I had one of these questions in my mind about what it would take to have a woman president in the United States because we weren't seeing anybody at that point. You, you know, when I was going through school and in business, you know, my class at Harvard Business School was 10 percent women. You know, it certainly has evolved and changed since then. But at the time, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't all that much. Uh, and so, you know, um, I had this, these questions of what would it take to have a woman president in the United States? I thought, well, maybe I could meet someone and ask them. But there's no one to ask in the United States. There still isn't anyone to ask in the United States. because We haven't yeah. done that yet. But there were at the time that I had this question, 15 women living who were president or prime minister of their country or had been. So I thought, well, maybe I could ask one of them, having no idea why I thought I could meet a president or a prime minister. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't from CNN, that's for sure. <laughs> um, you know, and, and never asked anyone what kind of a tree they would be if they were a tree. So <laughs> my inter interview skills were, were not great like yours are, at. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, but then did end up, uh, you know, sort of cutting to the chase. Um, it, it did end up meeting all the 15 of these world leaders and did a book and a video documentary. And that really set me on a different trajectory mm. than I was on before. You get mm. sort of out of business, and this different trajectory. And so created a council of these women leaders, uh, which still exists today. And there are 89 members now. This, uh, any woman who's freely elected head of state or head of government is invited to join our council. So it's, mm. it's been an interesting journey. You know, I've mm. continued to work in the for-profit and, and in the not-for-profit world. Uh, spending spending a number of years uh, working with investment banks and others, but I you know really I'll tell you I'll tell you what was a, a real circuit breaker connection for me. Yeah, and this was having to do with the council. So I was we put the council secretary at the uh, John F. Kennedy School of Government. Uh, Dean Joe Nye was gracious and invited us to put our secretary there. And I would have to walk every day through the John F. Kennedy Park, mm. at, you know, at, at Cambridge. Mm. And there's, there is a, 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 a slab of concrete of some sort of rock, which has a carving in it. And it's a quote from John F. Kennedy. And the quote is yeah. this. And I'd read it every day. I'd read it every day. And the quote was this. When at some future date, the high court of history sits in judgment on each one of us. Our success or failure in whatever office we hold will be measured by the answers to four questions. Were we truly men of courage? Were we truly men of dedication? Were we truly men of integrity? Were we truly men of judgment? You know, and after I'd read that every day, and I'd think to myself, such good questions to ask men. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> but they're really good questions to ask women, too. So. Sure. Right? So, but you know, we we've had this continuing archetype of what leaders look like, yeah, and yeah. we still do, and we still do. And you know, if, if you're in the dominant group, you can be assumed to potentially be a leader. If you're mm -hmm. in the non-dominant group, you're constantly having to prove it. 
You know, mm-hmm. you've got this, what's known as prove it again bias. You've got to continually prove yourself. And so that helps sharpen my thoughts around that. So that's a little bit of the path, my journey. It's It's been one, you know, um, Mary Catherine Bateson talks about composing a life, you know. And I think for women generally, it's not so much a, you know, a, a linear life. You just go from this to this to this to this. It's more of a patchwork quilt. You see mm-hmm. this, and then you see something else that looks like it might be interesting mm-hmm. and sort of connects and has an interesting color scheme, and then you move on to the next thing. And, you know, when you step back, it makes sense, and it looks beautiful. When you look mm-hmm. at it close up, you're wondering, okay, how did I get from here to here to here? But mm-hmm. you do. You do. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, that's phenomenal. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm, so th- I'm sure there's so much more. And um, and we will delve into that when we meet face to face one day, because uh, this this Zoom thing is fantastic. I mean, it's great because it's an equalizer. You can get to to people, and I can talk to you, and you can talk to me. And I'm in London, and you're in the United States. And where are you based, by the way? Um, are you in Washington, I believe? Uh, well, yeah, I, I I I'm in the in the Washington area. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you know. Um, but when you sit down face to face, I think the magic is very, 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 very special and and different. Yet, um, I'll ki- I'll ask you a few questions if that's okay. And just I'm interested in a few things. So I think um, when you, if you don't, if you don't mind, let's go back to these 15 leaders. Sorry, I said 14, and the reason I said 14 is because I got hooked on the number because of the Margaret Thatcher story. <laughs> when um, uh, do you do you want to share that for for the audience? Because sure. of course I, I I'm aware. Yeah, well, you you would have been right on the 14 in that I asked uh, Margaret, I asked them all, all 15 of them, to, whether they would take my interview. Uh, and all of them said yes, except Margaret Thatcher, who said, come back after you've met all other 14 of the world leaders, which is her way of getting rid of me, actually, of course, <laughs> you know, since she assumed that that was going to be an impossible task. Yeah. You know, but, you know, true to her word, once I had met all 14 of the others, I did meet Margaret Thatcher. And it was an interesting it, it was interesting in many ways. Um, she, like all of the other leaders, whether you agreed with her politics or not, she, like all of the other leaders, showed a, a strong trait of leadership, which is curiosity. Mm. Yeah. She was she, along with others, would ask what the others had said. In response to my questions. So interview, incidentally, my interviews kept getting longer and longer and longer because I was telling them what the others had said, you know. Um, so in fact, I was scheduled for a half an hour with uh, Margaret Thatcher and I was with her for over two and a half hours. Um, so wow. I got quite a bit of quite a bit of conversation with her. Um, so that's how you got to 14 slash 15. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's phenomenal because I, I think there are a couple of very important lessons. One is you said you weren't, you know, you won in this game. You had you had curiosity yourself. You were on a mission to kind kind of figure out what these uh, what these leaders uh, thought about leadership, how they how they when they started, how they performed their duty uh, in office, of course. And you know, you had this sort of courage and wherewithal and you just went for it, you know, which is fantastic. And of course, voila, you you had these and you said they didn't refuse. I mean, you didn't get rejections. I mean, you had acceptances all the way through. So a couple of things. So when you have those conversations and, and I'm sure you continue to have them, what what is it that you think they took away from those conversations? I know what you took away, of course, because you had the book and 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 this brilliant mind that you've now enriched with all this insight what value do you think you created and you touched on it briefly uh, on the 15th one for margaret thatcher the curiosity but be- beyond that as well what what sort of value did they get when they talked to you do you think and i'm sure they did it again and again then you set up the council right for women leaders and it's still there and it's still thriving so where's the value for those who are part of this having the dialogue with you well i i would say that the first value that i saw I thought that I, that was being contributed by me, me in the in the conversation was yeah. that for if you know if you're the only O in a room full of X's okay and things start happening to you you begin to think because you because you have no other O's to talk to right you begin to think and women do this particularly you begin to think gosh there must be something wrong with me because all this is happening to me rather than understanding it's happening to you because you're an O in a room full of X's. Right. Right. So 
it, for women often, and I think sometimes other historically underrepresented groups will, will, will say, gosh, there must be something wrong with me. There must be something pathologically wrong with me, rather than understanding, hey, that's just a social dynamic. And you're just caught up in this social dynamic of gender or race or ethnicity or whatever it is, mm. right? Mm. Um, mm. And so for me, I was when I, when someone would say something, they'd say, "Oh, I had this problem." Blah, blah, blah. It, it was kind of funny. I'd start to say, "Oh, Prime Minister, don't worry. Prime Minister so and so had the exact same set of problems." You know, so they began to take it away from them as an individual flaw, as something at, of a dynamic. Of, in the case of women, in these politicians, over scrutiny, mm. not so much tolerance for their mistakes. You know, they they were criticized for their dress, their voice, their hairstyle. You know, and each of them would think, "Oh gosh, must be something I'm doing." But in fact, every one of them said the exact same thing. So, to me, that was, I think, probably one of the most valuable parts for me, hopefully, of what I contributed to mm. them. And also they were able to, it was very interesting because I felt, because I had uh, interviewed the others of their peers, I think they were more comfortable discussing some of the more, you know, intractable issues that came to them. Because I, ha I had had, I had obviously, assumingly, you know, created the trust with the other leaders. Mm. And I, you know, I, it's very interesting because you talked about the patchwork quilt analogy mm. there earlier on and one of the things i've observed and i've been interviewing uh, men and women leaders right all throughout different subject areas and so on and when it comes to diversity of course it's disproportionately women who've been writing on diversity that's quite interesting in itself uh, the funny thing was once i was having a conversation with a man who said well that's not very that's not very diverse is it <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and that's when it starts to get silly. But uh, jokes aside, uh, I, you know, I've I've found that the the journey you called it nonlinear. The journey most of the women I've um, spoken with who've written these books or have shared personal stories has been has been quite convoluted. You know, and you say patchwork. That's a nice way of putting it. And filled with, I, I find trauma and distress is quite common. Right. It's it's almost a necessary ingre ingredient in shaping these women and helping them um, become, which is the final word I want to use, adaptable. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. adaptable to environments. It's an incredible. Um, and you see that today. I mean, I know you're close to uh, the Nordic countries because there's and of course, I, I, I do want to I do want to ask you about that in a moment. And how the Nordic countries have been so advanced and, and thinking way ahead, almost leading edge in terms of all policy, not just to do with diversity, equity, inclusion, but also especially with women, of course, uh, but also to do with education and health and many other social policy related issues. So um, when I think about men leaders and male leaders and a lot of books that you, you know, certainly when I was doing my master's or MBA and stuff, the books that we were taught and the people we were taught by and and there were great great leaders and great academics let's not let's not discount them and i won't mention them here but you know who i'm talking about and these big thinkers of course where you know you have the five forces model and you have this model and you have the the pyramids and you've got and and mostly men actually during the mba mostly men and um but then i discovered something quite interesting as i, as I started to speak to people from different parts of the world that there are some incredible, of course, thinkers who are who are documented, who are women, and and not in the West, but other parts of the world, Asia, parts of Asia, India, for example, even even um, as far as China, Japan, Indonesia, Thailand, and it's just opened my mind to all of these incredible possibilities, and that there is diversity has been happening for a long time. In your journey, t tell us a little bit about the internationalization aspects of it, because I know you're in the U.S. and I know you know the U.S. world and the markets well. What about other other international markets? What have you learned about women leaders versus the U.S. or the West? Well, I mean, it's 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 just a a, a point to to focus on. You know, in, the United States hasn't yet to have a woman president, for example, while we have countries all over the world 
who have pres women presidents and prime ministers. Now, there's an, a fair number of dynamics that go along with that. You know, if you're in a parliamentary system, like the UK is, for example, and other countries, um, then, you know, they're far more uh, friendly to historically out of power groups, right? Because mm -hmm. you can get into coalitions. It's not a winner take all system. Um, you know, you often have a president who is more of a symbolic position and then the prime minister who's more the executive position. So often yeah. the entry point for women is the symbolic one. You know, she's the mother of the country. He's the father of the country. You know, that kind of duality to it. You know, it's it's it, it, it's it's still archetypes, but at least it gets women into that system, into the system. You know, you, you've also got in many countries, unlike the U.S., where the U.S. pretty well constricts who is going to, quote, acceptable as a president of the country. Now, that has historically been vice presidents chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and governors. Now, we've had a, a little bit of an experience, experience with a business person. We kind of know how that one's turning out. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and we have had a little bit of experience with Senate. Okay, but you think about that as a really small pool, mm -hmm. particularly if you think about how many women are governors or how many women are senators. Mm -hmm. or there's been no woman chairman of the Joint Chiefs, right? So the pool is really small. Mm -hmm. When you get into other systems, you know, the woman can be you know, she can be a teacher, she can be an artist, she can be having run a not-for-profit. She, You know, she the, the fields are much bigger and the acceptance of what is a, a good prime minister or president is much broader. So you have a much wider pool of people to, to who could be conceivably considered as a leader. So yeah. you, you, got some, you got some things here that are real. You know, when you talk about the Nordic countries, I mean, interestingly, the Nordic countries... You know, they're small, they're relatively homogeneous. Uh, the trade unions have been pretty powerful, which has helped equality in many cases. Um, the uh, In most of those Nordic countries, uh, long ago in history, they were fishing cultures, which meant that the men went out to fish for 10 or 11 months of the year, and the women ran the country. Mm. Yeah. So you start looking at all of these kinds of things. And then if you look at other parts of the world, um, Asia, South Asia, uh, there's a, a real strong uh, notion of family, you know, and so you get some real dynastic leaders mm -hmm. coming there, you know, and what's interesting about that is that the dynasties are not just reserved for the men in the dynasty, but the women in the dynasty are also considered acceptable as right. part of being a leadership. So you begin to see all these differing, differing ways and reasons and things like that. You know, with varying levels of success in all cases, you know, about not not I'm not sure exact number today, but at least about 10 years ago, about a third of the women came to power after their husbands or fathers were assassinated. You know, mm. so and that's where you picked up some of the legacy kind of things. Mm. You know, I mean, India, for example, has a classic sense of that legacy in it. But what's what's interesting about that is that the cultures accept the women as the leaders also. Yes. You, know, you don't see that so much in, you know, in the West, for example. So yes. anyway, yes. Lo lots of interesting reasoning behind all of this. Yeah. Yeah. You wrote a bunch, you've written a bunch of books and um, at different time frames. you know, the, the, the most recent one, the elephant and the mouse, yeah. uh, people should go and buy. Of course it's on Amazon. It was published in March, 2022. Prior to that, you wrote the, the wrote the loudest stuck. I think that was 2009. So big, big sort of, gap and both books actually talk to the same sort of issue related to diversity related to inclusion related to big changes that we need to make in business and society to be able to be more progressive and, and open-minded about human development and then you had uh, you know um the women world leaders that I, essentially that was your interview the, the 15 interviews you did transcripted and, and analyzed and then serving uh, serving them right, you said. I think it was called, it was actually, what was the first title? And then you got it, you had to change it, right? You had a different title yeah. for it. Uh, it was 50 Ways to Lose Your Customer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That would that would probably do so well these days with the blog it, market. It would you know? still do so well, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that would be the headline that the AI says that you should have. So right. you, were, you were way ahead at that time. And so 
Uh, tell me a bit about your last book, because it's the most recent one, of course. And, you know, we like to promote authors. That's the big thing that, you know, I care about, too, and and uh, ensure people read the stuff that they must read. Uh, what was the thought process behind the book? And why did you write it then? And, um, you know, what, what is the big takeaway for, for us? What, what's that hook for us to go and purchase the book? Well, thanks for that very much. That's yeah. nice. You know, it's interesting. A lot of stuff, although I think it actually, 2009 was a pub date, but I think it came out a little bit later than that. But nevertheless, okay. it's still quite, it's it's used quite frequently. I get this comments from corporations all the time that they still use it because I think the the the, the value of the, the duck in, in many ways was that, you know, you, you use the phrase dominant, dominant, dominant. I use a lot of differing ways of expressing diversity in, in a way that pe everyone can hear it, everyone can listen to it, so mm. that people don't feel like, oh, you're not talking about me, or you're accusing me, or whatever, you know, so I find that that vocabulary, and, you know, you know, <laughs> a little bit of satisfaction, the, the, the loudest stuck is uh, Wiley and Son's best diversity selling book, so, wow. you know, it's, it's done very well, and, and, you know, the, the elephant and the mouse was actually initially a chapter in the loudest duck, um, but it and in between the the books, I've written numerous articles, so sort of evolving my thinking around this. And the reason I then began to focus on what the, these this notion of the elephant and the mouse, which is basically just to you know, it's the subtitle of it is uh, moving away from the illusion of inclusion, uh, and the illusion of inclusion is uh, Cheryl Kaiser's fra phrase out of University of Washington, which I've. Uh, you know, she's graciously let me borrow it. Um, so, but that, why that became so apparent to me is because all of these organizations between the time I wrote The Loudest Duck and The Elephant Mouse had been, many organizations had been working very hard in their DE and IB efforts, mm -hmm. right? Putting together a lot of programs, but, right. you know, having the senior management say they're committed to it putting employee resource, resource groups in place, um, having diversity trainings, having diversity awareness weeks, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing, um, supplier diversity efforts. So a lot of stuff going on in a lot of organizations, right? What seemed to be, there seemed to be a, 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 a broken needle, however, because uh, the, the effort wasn't equaling any outcome. Right. The dial really wasn't turning very much. No. Yeah. All of this effort, and you got maybe a 1% increase or a 2% increase of women or other historically underrepresented groups in positions of power, if that. you know. Mm. So it, that's when, so Cheryl's notion was, look at all of this doing of all these programs creates this illusion that you're actually doing something. Right. Right. And for the dominant group members, who see all of this effort going on, they say, well, gosh, yeah, we're a fair organization. We're working really hard on this stuff. But in fact, the matter is, the real things haven't changed. Hmm. The real gatekeepers and the barriers to entry haven't changed. And that's why 20 years later, you know, you still, you may have less of an intake problem with major organizations, hmm. but you still have a significant upgrade problem. Mm. Yeah, you can mm. get people into the organization, but boy, they sure don't progress in the numbers that they should. Mm. If, mm. if numbers were the only determiner and the only metric, right? right? right. So, so the elephant and the mouse, and, and it also became quite clear to me, there, there's what I call the myth of meritocracy. You know, that again, you know, I've, I've yet to hear any senior leader, any senior leader say, I got to the top of this organization because I was subtly advantaged. Right. Who says yeah. that? Nobody says that. <laughs> you know, they think, well, I got to the top because I'm the best and it's a fair organization and it's so, a meritocracy and only the best get to the top. And I just happen to be one of the best, hmm, hmm, you know, hmm, hmm. which turns out to be not true at all. Yeah, it's just not true at all. And I, it's, you know, I'm more and more imploring organizations to really deep dive, do a deep dive into their data to see who thinks the organization is a meritocracy and who doesn't think it's a meritocracy and why. Yeah. And then you begin to see 
really what's happening. Because the problem is that if you're a dominant group member, and that's probably why the books aren't being written generally by dominant group members. If you're a dominant group member, you think the world works for the world works for AF the mm -hmm. way the world works for me, but you know, me, dominant group member. But no, the world doesn't work that way. You have, have a different lived experience than that, that, let's just say, white male CEO. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a different set of experiences than that person has, mm -hmm. right? But people at the top often feel like, well, that, you know, the world works pretty well here. So, you know, pretty fair. Everybody gets their fair shot. Everybody gets a chance at it. Everybody's evaluated equally. The numbers show who's good and who's not good. You know, so what, what are you complaining about? You know, what's your problem? Right. right. Yeah. So that's when it really got me to start really thinking about why this elephant and mouse thing, which is basically if you're the elephant in the room, you don't really know much about the mouse. If you're the mouse in the room, you know everything about the elephant. Right. Right. I mean, you could go you, you could go around the world, couldn't you? Any country, small or large, and they will know who the president of the United States is. Right? Yeah. And you could go to virtually almost everybody in the United States and ask them who the president or the prime minister of Sweden is. Eh, hmm. They're not gonna know. Right. Right. You know, yeah. lucky if they you know, they know the Canadian <laughs> prime minister. <laughs> I think I think you make a great point. Let me ask you this then. You know, there are some realities that we've got to deal with right now. And we we know what those hurdles are, right? One could say it's a demographic, it's a generation of people, they're not going to change. They're used to power, had it for many, many decades. It could be families, could be lineage, could be one way of thinking. It could be about dominant, non-dominant. That's a core part of it. You know, there's a certain community that's dominant regardless of race, demographics. It could be in any part of the world. You're right. There is a dominant community. In fact, it could be caste driven. You know, heck, yes, it's not absolutely. all, you know, it could be all, it could be so many different flavors. There's a dominant community that you're right, does have that response, that response you just shared. But here is another dynamic. I don't know if you've seen this. I've been talking to a lot of, I would call them non-dominant. Let's just say non-dominant. They're not, they are definitely not the dominant. And this is the problem we're facing with diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging. And maybe it needs a rebrand. I don't know, because you know how, how susceptible we are, how fickle and impulsive and volatile we are as people. We suddenly get ca caught on to the, the, the most, it's a reductive mentality, right, of, of around everything. No one really wants to spend time understanding anything, especially in the TikTok social media generation, where if, if, you, if, you, if you do anything beyond 15 seconds, then you lost people. It's insane. Yeah. Even on YouTube, for Christ's sake, you know, the shorts, <laughs> which is like if we have a one hour show and I was being forced by people, oh, you've got to, ah, you've got to do 10 minutes, 15, bam, bam, poof, poof. People don't have any time for this. I said, seriously, we have to debate and discuss things. Are you insane? Like we, we have to talk about this. This is not a, this is not a sensational, you know, Netflix series. We have to talk about issues in detail. So I've been trying to convince the younger folk to, to think and listen a little bit more. But here's what, what I was going to say. I've been speaking to these non-dominant group executives. So ima let's imagine they're, they're folks in companies, okay? They're non-dominant. And as soon as I say, well, look, I run Diversity Economics Institute, da 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 I'm building a large language model, collecting all of the data in the, in the world into like a GPT environment. So you can talk to it. It's your friend. You can make decisions. Laura's work, all four books, bang, in there. Imagine, imagine the vast amount of knowledge that you can pull out if you're an executive making decisions. They're like, yeah, yeah. And they jump straight to the same, to the first thing. Listen, mate, I've worked so hard to get where I have. I've got opportunity. I've had opportunities. It's why are you making such a big deal out of it? And you know what happens? People who don't deserve the jobs get it. It's this quota system. So it's very, it's very, now this is a problem we deal with. And th this is a non-dominant group I'm talking about. So A, are you seeing this? B, what is your view in, on it? And is there a way forward with this? Maybe it requires total rebranding or whatever it may be, but what are you seeing on your side? Just so that I'm being fair, it's not just about the dominant who are, are difficult. It's also the non-dominants who are thinking in a very different way right now, sometimes. You know, I think, I think you are absolutely right that there are some people in the non-dominant group yeah. who have in fact gone through this process of, to get to where they want to go. They, they may or may not, they may, may have so 
internalized some of the processes to not even notice that they had to work twice as hard to get to the same place. They couldn't make as many mistakes, you know, as someone of the dump. They may not have even seen that happening to them. They just had, they had normalized that. Well, that's, that's right. just the way it is. And that's what we have to do to get ahead, you know. And then it's interesting. What I, The Financial Times did a very interesting article about uh, quotas, right? Hmm. And what they, they found, interestingly, that, at a, and they're talking about women, at a younger age, most women rejected the concept of quota. You know, oh, I don't want to be seen as a quota woman. I don't want people to see me that way, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, there was a, <laughs> a direct relationship between accepting the need for quotas with age. That is, the older a woman got, mm. the more she understood the pervasive social dynamics that were only going to be broken apart by some sort of affirmative mechanisms. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, you know, I don't know when you talk to some of these women or whatever, but generally speaking, the older a woman gets, the more she needs, she sees the, yeah. we need circuit breakers because nobody gives up power easily, you know, mm. and, you know, and also, again, if you are, as I've talked about, if you are not in a critical mass, if you're the only O, you know, the chances are that you're going to try to turn yourself into an X. Mm. You know, because that's the only choice you have in some ways, mm. right? So it doesn't surprise me if these singular individuals have, you know, evolved their thought process in that way, mm. You know? mm. which is why, you know, I'm I'm big on data. You know, yeah. I'm big on showing people, hey, the fact of the matter is you're, you know, you, you, you know, you always have to hit it out of the ballpark. You know, yeah. if, if you if you're going to if you're non-dominant, you got to be exceptional at every point. You can't make as many mistakes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're on a tightrope. And these women don't even realize maybe that they've ended up on a tightrope where they've learned how to speak in a really, you know, I mean, they, they're, they're not doing what, as much code switching as, for example, a, a black person would do in the United States. That's right. And That's I right. think code switching exists in other cultures also. Oh, yeah. You know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, welcome, well, welcome to the United Kingdom. I mean, you know, uh, I have to, I have to tell you. I mean, you know, this show is straight talking. As a ethnic man, I've of Indian origin. I, I've been in the UK most of my life, but I have to tell you, although it's fair and representative in many ways, and there's a lot of justice equality and so on and so forth, because of the many reasons you and I have discussed, accents matter hugely. If I didn't speak the way I did, which I live here, so it's fine, but I have to say there is conformity. If I was to speak to a, an aunt of mine who didn't speak English that well, my accent changes. My English accent changes to become more Indian. It's a natural thing. It happens all the time. And then I hit straight talk and I'm like, you know, I'm in with my British accent. It's all accentuated and it just happens naturally. I don't go put it on. But from place to place... I have to keep conforming. You call it code switching. Absolutely. But I have to tell you, it's it's friggin' exhausting. <laughs> yeah. It's exhausting. And and no one's quantified that. I don't I, no one's quantified how difficult and and, and you, you know, people say, oh, you're ambidextrous. Look how yeah. look how ambidextrous and adaptable you are. And but I, it is exhausting, of course. Sorry, I, I interjected, but go, go on. No, you, yeah. you just proved the point. Yeah. You know, it and it is exhausting. And that kind of style compliance can be very exhausting. You, uh, you know, you or a woman walks into the room, how is she going to speak? <laughs> you know, is she going to speak forcefully? Well, if she speaks forcefully, people aren't going to really like her. If she doesn't speak forcefully, well, nobody's going to think she's a leader. You know, uh, what happens when she gets interrupted? Which she will get interrupted. You know, what, how is she going to handle that? What happens if she says her idea? And then, you know, a man graciously takes her idea and uses it. You know, <laughs> how is she going to do? How is she going to handle that? Where is she going to sit? Like you, how are you going to talk? Mm. Yeah. You mm. walk into that room thinking all those things. Absolutely. If you're the dominant group member, poof, you get to think about the last, you know, football match. You get to think about, you know, your last golf game. You get to think about what's on the agenda for today and, you know, how you're going to make sure you get your points across because it's mm. a competitive kind of thing. Mm. It's a very different world. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it is exhausting. And, it, you know, you, you do, you read articles periodically about, you know, how exhausting it is for, 
for women to have kind of the two jobs of at home and at work kind of thing. Yeah. You know, but I wish somebody would quantify. I don't know how you do it. Stick other sticking electrodes in somebody's brain to to figure out, you know, how much more energy it takes. Now, what that does give you, I will say, on the mouse's part, is that means that you have developed, you know, sort of a hypervigilance. You've developed a, a, a you know, a, set, a different sense about other people. You know, you can you can actually call it empathy to a certain extent, mm -hmm. but it's certainly a, a more of an awareness of others. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the mouse dynamic. That's the way the mouse can multitask. I mean, you can have to think about your accent and you have to think about what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So you can multitask, right? You can be much more aware of the other, which is incidentally a good trait of leadership. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in a funny sort of way, exhausting as it is, it also develops traits of leadership. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question about, um, I'm conscious of time, but I've got to ask you if some of these questions are very important. So let's think about the um, typical organization today. And I won't name any organization, but let's think of a big bank because you were at a bank too. So you have that experience, the corporate experience. And in these big banks, most often uh, you have one person who's the CEO and many banks, not all, obviously have men as CEOs. And there are some women floating around and uh, who are, uh, you know, uh, who are under a lot of scrutiny, actually. Mm -hmm. And there's one big bank in the U.S. who has a woman CEO right now. And she, she is, the, if you notice the news articles, and we use a lot of AI to study these companies for some work that I do. And the way the press um, portrays that leader is very different to when there was a man, male leader, in that job. Honestly, I mean, it's easy to tell. You can look at keywords and you look at what they focus on. Like you said, the outfits, I mean, the dress, it's a blue, she's wearing a blue. Yeah, what's, what, I mean, what, what's that going to do with any, Jamie Dimon doesn't have to face that every time he goes right. and speaks at the JP Morgan conference. Anyways, um, you, you have these organizations and there's something quite interesting going on with DEIB. So here's what's phenomenal. And I know you're you're part of the trustee committee at World Economic Forum. And World Economic Forum, the, the good people there and McKinsey believe that the diversity, equity, inclusion market, the spend in that market is going to jump from 10 billion, which is today, to 30 billion or so in the next seven years. Okay. So that's a 13% odd compound annual growth rate. That's huge. That means 3x more money spent on suppliers and vendors and programs and so on. Now, we've got to make sure that's not all squandered and wasted, of course, because so far it feels like it's a bit of a, a dead end, frankly, uh, because the impact hasn't, to your point, effort versus outcome. It's not. We haven't really seen it. But there is this interesting dynamic we're observing. Okay, it's not. I haven't got full data to prove it, but I, I can share the, the anecdotes, which is to do with um, HR and diversity as an organization. So when COVID hit, you had all these diversity leaders who came into these jobs. And there were many, by the way, of course. And I've had the privilege of speaking to some who've left the jobs, who've told me some awful stories of uh, lies and misogyny. And, um, you know, I was told to come in the job and I was told I'd be given a budget, but actually I outsourced my a DEI strategy to X consultancy. They did it. I oversaw it like a program manager. Then I used to turn up to the board level meetings. I don't really have an empire, no real budget. I have one direct report. And then over time, comments started to come. You know, you could hear the little comments. What, 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 what's she doing here? What she, why is she even here? Uh, because I was the only one without a, without, you know, a, a portfolio per se. And then many left and then moved around. And then the HR leader, CHRO, now they're not all women, some, but a lot of them are, um, wanted that, they want that, they want that gig. They want diversity inside HR. They don't want it to be a separate uh, field. And I'm seeing these, um, this is a very sort of executive related question, but I'm seeing this dynamic play out. I'm talking to them and I'm hearing what's going on. So this power play going on, uh, yes, men are in it too, but so are women going on in the organization. That's not very helpful in the grand scheme of things when you and I are having this sort of really visionary, pragmatic conversation, trying to figure out the blockers, you're imploring, you're telling CEOs, you've got to change, go into the lived experiences and so on. But how does one deal with this as well? Because it's a reality. I'm just, you know, playing devil's advocate, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's very much a reality. Yeah. And, you know, you see this, the analogy that I, that I give to it is, um, you know, and I used to work in the airline industry, 
Right. Uh, what is the number one responsibility of an airline? The number one responsibility of an airline is to keep an airplane from falling out of the sky. Right. Right. It's not marketing. It's not what food you're serving. It's none of that. Mm. The first and most important thing is keep that airplane from falling out of the sky, mm -hmm. i.e. safety. Right? Safety first, because you don't have an airplane, an airline, if you don't have safety. Right. Okay, what does safety mean? Everybody's responsible for it. The numbers and um, the metrics are measured every way you could possibly measure them. Right? Everyone knows what the metrics are. Everyone is constantly trained mm. on it. Everything is transparent. The senior leadership is measured on it, as is everyone else measured on it. You know, now think about all the components of what it takes mm. to make that happen. All right. So you could say the same thing for diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is not a goal in and of itself. Mm. E, E, and I, and, and belonging to E, I, and B, uh, however you want to phrase it, opportunity, however you, you want to put it. That those are tools in your toolbox to make sure that the organization is operating at its highest and best, that it's using its teams, uh, talent and the teams at its best, that mm -hmm. everyone's performing at their optimal, that the mission of the organization is being met, that the goals of the organization are being met. It's a tool in the toolbox and mm -hmm. an essential one. And we know that's essential because we've got all sorts of research that says if you don't feel like you're included, if you don't feel like you're belonging, you know, if you don't feel like that there's equal opportunity, you're going to leave. You're going to silently quit, right. whatever, all of those things. So if you look at it and say, hey, if I took the, the, the tools that I need for safety and used and applied them to diversity, you wouldn't be having this squawk, you know, this kind of boundary quarrel. Well, mm -hmm. it's mine. No, it's mine. No, it's mine. Hmm. You wouldn't have that. You, hmm. This would be an essential part of every manager's responsibility in the organization, right? Hmm. And then you'd have to monitor it and measure it. And you'd have to give the people, I mean, the people who run safety in the, you think they don't have resources behind them? They have a huge amount of resource behind them. And they hmm. can stop an airplane from flying, you know? So they have. The, so you just have to say, what are the resources that you are giving to people if you want to make sure that you, everyone is operating at their highest and best? within the organization. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it should be quite apparent that, you know, this you don't have some sort of pro forma Potemkin village, you know, diversity effort. Right. You know? And right. It, the, the other challenge, at least we're seeing in the United States, and you and I talked about a little bit as an aside, is that, you know, the, uh, the S Supreme Court has not exactly been a very welcoming kind of uh, institution for mm -hmm. some of the, these efforts. And so you are actually seeing some organizations, not all, but some organizations pulling back. Right. Yeah. And then, and that's, you know, some organizations are full speed ahead. Some organizations are okay, status quo. And some organizations saying, well, you know, this is too much of a risk for us. We're not going to do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. I think that's also to do with, the, I think they've just got the whole point, the, 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 the they've got it wrong in terms of they haven't understood, to your point, what this is all about. And I agree with you. And I think this is where I think we have to work together, all of us. And there are many of us championing this cause for different diverse communities, be it women, be it LGBTQ, uh, you know, you name it. And um, I think each of these communities, and one of the big things I'm trying to do is outside of using AI and all those clever things, I'm trying to build a micro ecosystem, a global one, and it's quite hard to do with smaller organizations who understand lived experiences because their their community their micro community are the people like the lgbt community the gay community for example just in a, a city like delhi for example in india they've got their own lived experiences you know some of them have got jobs some of them are entrepreneurs what i'm hearing from them is just it's phenomenal it's the, it's it's how they want to be treated it's how they believe they will be optimal how they believe their potential will be realized if you want to play the whole, you know, capitalism card. But I think it's it's not somehow like most things. It's just not getting to the top. Um, and like it's frustrating, as you know, you, as you know, it just never really gets to the top. But do you believe uh, as we close off, do you believe there are there are 
bright spots out there that you can see anywhere? I mean, it doesn't always have to be companies that you believe gives you hope. I guess there is. And that's why it's a leading question. And please tell us who they are, because we can go study them and give each other more motivation to, to continue on this mission. Well, look, I'm not going to name names as or, but there yes, are companies please. out there. You know, <clears throat> there are organizations out there who are trying to embrace this as much as possible. They're, right. you know, they're trying to understand these experiences. They're using data. You know, yeah. I know that's something that you you're you're quite familiar with. And that's right. And welcome. You know, the, the we we don't if if all we're going to do is use representational data, and that's my Noah's Ark. Hmm. You know, okay, we're just going to bring two of each in the ark. You know, if that's all we're going to do, you're never going to get anywhere because diversity doesn't in, ensure inclusion. Diversity doesn't ensure equal opportunities. Diversity does not ensure belonging. You have to do a lot more within the organization to to have those things if those are your goal. Yeah. But I think that there are a number of organizations who are on this journey and a little further along on the journey than others. And you do see it in some representational case in terms of what does senior management look like? You know what? How, how employees view the organization? Um, so I, I am optimistic. I think that I worry that organizations are going to feel a little risk adverse around this, or feel like you know that. But one of the challenges is that Virginia Valerian wrote a book called "A Why So Slow." And she said that it wasn't that men, in this case, she was talking about men didn't want, you know, fairness. So they didn't want equal pay for everyone. They they did. Mm -hmm. But what they really worried most about and, and really resisted was loss of centrality. Yeah. If you are no longer the central where everyone operates around you and for you, that's a loss. You know, so one of the real things to me is who are the organizations that have effectively been able to talk about this, not as a win-lose or I gain, you lose, mm -hmm. but as a win-win. Yeah. And mm -hmm. there are organizations that I think that are, that are they're getting better and better at that, at mm -hmm. this notion of, okay, we all win when the organization, when everyone feels like they're included, when everyone feels like they have an ally, when mm -hmm. everyone feels like they're being mentored. Yeah. You know, when everyone feels like they're getting the good feedback they need, so which is what we need to develop as human beings. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. When I was, um, I've been spending some time talking to people who've been writing about uh, spirituality, a consciousness, uh, even near-death experiences that people have been through and um, practices like yoga, for example, mm -hmm. which is very, very powerful, breathing, yoga, and so on. And it's, and why I mentioned this is because we close off with leadership. I think, we all have, we are all leaders in our own right. Some have, you know, with authority, some without authority, some with big organizations, some with no organizations. Um, the power of the pen, you know, the power of the book, the books that you write. Uh, that's the beauty of being human. And one of the things I'm seeing, the two, two interesting observations, by the way, for some reason last year and early this year, a lot of my guests have been in their 70s and above. No, this is not by design. It's just the way, I don't know how it's happened. And it's been an incredible education for me. And because uh, I've learned so much, the wisdom, you know, the life experience, I've learned so much. And I've been uh, swallowing it all up, but I've been like, wow, this is fantastic. And the two things that have come out, the first one consistent is what, is what they, they refer to as being human. Now mm -hmm. that means different things to different people. Some are ex hedge fund managers, uh, you know, did whatever they did, make loads of money, and now realize that was all sort of useful in its time, but pointless. Now, some are big ex-tech leaders, use all the tech in the world now thinking, oh, my God, AI is going to, you know, destroy the, the human life and the way we've built society to date and so on. But being human is about not forgetting uh, who you and I are. Uh, you know, embracing each other, having a coffee, having a glass of wine, spending time looking at each other, listening to each other, all of those normal things that human beings do, which we worry a little bit about the next few generations, whether they'll have some of those things just because they're exposed to different medium, you know, from a technology standpoint. And then the other one is, uh, I think, related to um, giving back. And I'm only saying this because uh, I am not religious at all, but I do believe that um, we are losing 
uh, we're losing this the, the, the power of humanity and and from the point of view of uh, in 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 sanskrit it's called seva say Se, seva means um uh, giving giving back you know and i think what you're doing today i mean you're giving back you're taking time and you're sharing your knowledge and your wisdom and i think the more we do that with one another there may be a greater chance that we can understand each other's lived experiences because frankly i'm here to understand your lived experience only a little bit only an hour of it really but now i know a little bit more about you and maybe i have a little bit more empathy and maybe i'll be a little bit more compassionate and i think that's how i see these podcasts by the way i don't just see them as oh great knowledge and you'll be the smartest thing in town because i do believe memory is going to be commoditized with ai you know unfortunately at some point with these chipsets at the back of your head but emotion compassion empathy these are our strengths so uh, that's why i have you here because i'm not just listening to you because the books i can read of course and why would i need you on the show but i need it's it's the human side of what you've just said and so you know i my last 20 seconds how was today for you uh, thank you for giving me time you do so many of these shows but it'd be good to get some feedback uh, so we can improve we can get better and so on but how was the the last hour for you before we uh, say goodbye to you well first of all thank you for for being so curious yourself um, being willing to to take and synthesize. I mean, synthesizing app is an enormously difficult thing to do. And you've been synthesizing constantly. You're taking mine, you're taking all these hundred other people that you've had. So that's an amazing skill set. And so you're offering that to me and you're offering that to your listeners. So so thank you. Um, it has been it has been an excellent experience. I appreciate the fact that you didn't just say, okay, just give me some tools for getting, you know, I want some more tools. You know, I just want some more tips on how we can improve or whatever. You didn't do that. You were much more trying to find out, okay, what's the humanity behind this? You know, why are we doing this? Because I mean, you could look at diversity and say, well, there's a, it's definitely an efficacy argument. You can definitely make an efficacy argument for it, mm. but you're also talking about the equity argument, mm. which is mm. a different kind of argument. The, I suppose for me, the, the best definition of a leader, and you're you're embracing that by talking about things like yoga and meditation, bringing your whole self and understanding, is what Vivaldi said made the best composer. He said the best composer has a cool head and a hot heart. You Beautiful. need both. You need both. Beautiful. Nicely summarized. I couldn't have done it better. So... Uh, thank you so much. We um, would love to, at some point down the line, have you back to talk more because uh, it's an important topic and we have a lot of work to do on this subject. And <laughs> you, you, you've you started way before many of us. And uh, please keep us posted on your well-being and um, your your work and your articles. Before you close, where do we find you and your work? Well, a lot of people who want to sort of dig deeper. Sure. Um, if they want to connect with me, they can do it through LinkedIn. You, yeah. It might take a little while because, uh, you know, we, we have to filter through everything. But yeah. feel free to do that. I do have a website, you know, www.laurelistwood.com. Um, you know, just feel free to reach out to me that way. And I'm, I'm happy to, to, uh, to respond to any inquiries that your, your, your listeners have. So thank you. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you, Laura. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you, listeners. And I'll catch up with you um, very, very soon. Be well. Thank you.